What if I were to suggest that you play a key role in the awakening world? And that you are watching this because you have heard the call. We can start right now by opening our hearts and minds. Welcome to the awakening world. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Awakening World. I'm Love Coach Scott Katamas, and we are kicking off this week a new series of deeper conversations with people that we admire. In Wednesday night's show, when we first did this, of course, we always do shows on Wednesdays and Saturday nights, and it was really powerful, very dynamic conversation. And um, a lot of you, our regular Zoom members, said, wow, that was one of the best shows ever. And so uh, we're going to continue that tonight by conversing with some really wonderful people, some of whom you've seen on the show before and some of whom are newbies. Um, we're gonna kick it off in a moment with Linda Starwolf, who is an amazing shaman, uh, author, teacher, and she's gonna lead us on a beautiful practice. Um, and that'll be followed by Donna Leia, who we are welcoming back, who's gonna help guide us into the listening field. And then Magic and Maggie are back. Now, Magic, and Maggie have both been on the show individually, but they are also a beautiful couple, currently engaged. And so we get to experience them as a couple. And then we have another pair of new friends that we're introducing to the Awakening World, to our Global Peace Tribe audience, David and Karila. And they're doing something quite wonderful, which we're looking forward to hearing about. And we have a very special treat. Our good friend, Andrew Cameron Bailey, has given birth to a child. You know, it took 20 years for he and Connie to marry, but they finally uh, had a baby, and we're going to be experiencing Andrew's baby um, during the show, so look forward to that. Um, but of course, the person who really makes this show sing, literally and figuratively, we're going to start things off with beloved brother Omashar. Yes, and that would me be me, and I'm really looking forward to see Andrew's baby. It is, um, I hear, quite a, um, quite a, uh, I'll let you describe it later, but <laughs> I can't even find the word, it's so slipping me. Anyway, it's intelligent, we know that. And so welcome everybody, namaste, and welcome to all of those watching us on Facebook, YouTube, and all of our streaming partners. Thank you so much, Simon Network. And uh, <clears throat> without further ado, we are going to, I am going to sing a song called In the Stillness. And so take a few deep breaths because we're going to do some work together tonight as well. And because of the stillness, we're going to have this little backdrop here. And I'm going to go change my mic source and I shall see you in a sec. The quieter you become, the more you can hear in the silence, in the 
Let's all give him a beautiful twinkle. Thank you, Omashar. My pleasure. All the wonderful, wonderful ways that you get things moving and grooving. Thank yeah, you. I, I felt so deeply into our uh, guests tonight. And these, I had the three songs just jumped out. They're just perfect. And this one is because next, of course, we have Star. And so I thought we'd start within the stillness. It's beautiful. I, I love the lyrics of that song. Really love the lyrics of that Thank song. You. Thank you. And we're going to have two more Omashar songs tonight. So um, I'm grateful for that and grateful for you, Omashar. Thank you. Well, you saw her saging us. That's a wonderful way to uh, get things started. Um, and of course, this is wonderful Linda Starwolf. She's been on the show a few times now. And we always appreciate the incredible wisdom that she brings. Uh, we're going to hear about her newest book, her 13th book. She's written 13 books. Um, and she's going to share the energies tonight of calling in the age of Aquarius in our lives. Um, and really, you're, you're so connected to Mama Earth. Uh, of course, she does shamanic breath work, and she's going to lead us on a ceremony. But welcome back. So good to have you with us. 
Thank you, Scott. And I just feel so joyful tonight watching everybody and my heart just with that song. Uh, thank you, Amashari. It was so beautiful. And I have two of my dearest friends sitting here next with me. Uh, and my dog is lying at my feet. <laughs> and my husband's in the next room making sure the technology is running well. And my two friends that are here are two of the, the uh, closest friends who also work with me at our programs. And I'm just so grateful. I just want to start out by saying that. And Scott, you're, you're truly a magical man because you're so filled with love. That's what magic is really about. And everybody else here, some I've met before and some I haven't, I can just feel your, um, your spirits touching mine. So, you know, it's really an illusion that we're separate. Mm -hmm. So I wish we could spread that throughout the world. And that's my prayer. And, uh, you know, I thought tonight I would go ahead. I'm really feeling this right now. Bring out the old peace symbol uh, that I wore in the 60s and 70s and the, the peace earrings. And, you know, peace, true peace never goes out of style. Um, so in a little bit, I want to, in just a minute, I want to share um, a shamanic breathwork ceremony with you all. Generally, it's anywhere from an hour to hour and a half, but obviously uh, I condense this sometimes into five minutes, 15 minutes, whatever is needed, we can open up and go into that journey. Um, as um, Scott mentioned, the Aquarian Shaman. So I just go ahead and, and go sure, into... But, you know, I, actually, I'm going to come in for a moment because I want to riff on something you said. Yeah, go for it. Riff, let's riff. I love it. I love that you're bringing the peace symbol in. And, um, yes. <laughs> you know... I grew up in a, a suburb of Los Angeles, and I had the good fortune at the age of 12, I worked, I got a job working in a psychedelic shop. Um, <laughs> records, you know, but you'd walk in and uh, they had the, the black lights and all the, remember the psychedelic posters? I or, remember you know, well. There'd be Jim Morrison and Donovan greeting you, you know, in psychedelia. And um, I went to my first love in when I was 12 years old at Griffith Park. Um, and so I was a flower child and I had, I'd go to school with my little flower child button and, you know, um, so, you know, the, the flower child hippie thing, that's where a lot of us and a lot of people yeah. in our audience, you know, that's when we grew up. That's right. Know? Yeah. And, and so, we haven't lost the faith. <laughs> and well, here we are, here we are, you know, whatever it is, 50 years later, 60 years later, still holding, uh, holding the highest vision for consciousness. Um, and there is a lot of crazy stuff going on in the external world, but we also live on a planet of polarity that for every action, right. there's an equal and opposite reaction. And so we are the reaction to the craziness. We are the reaction to the hopelessness. Uh, and, uh, we're here to provide hope and inspiration. And I know that's something you do quite beautifully. So I just wanted to add that thought and, and let's see what, what your thoughts are about that. Well, absolutely. I mean, hence the Aquarian shaman, you know, right. I've been trying to get this, uh, you know, Aquarian shaman uh, published through uh, Baron. Well, anybody that would publish it, but especially through a major publishing company like Baron Company for about 10 years. And it was either like, oh, it's this or that or whatever. And then finally, all of a sudden they were ready. And, you know, that's I was born prematurely. So it seems that I've always been a little bit I'm not going to say ahead of others. I, I don't like that sound of that, but it seems like that I've I've usually felt weird and different, and that's okay. I've you know I've learned to accept that about myself that I'm usually thinking of something that's going to happen and I'm visioning it and seeing it maybe several years or even decades before it's going to happen and that's all right. And I think there's a lot of us out here who have been visionaries, as you said, all the way back from the, the 60s, maybe even some of you all from the 50s, the 60s and 70s. And, you know, I didn't grow up in LA, I grew up in Western Kentucky. <laughs> and so I was a real um, anomaly there for a long time. But then when all the boys started come back wounded uh, to our hometown from Vietnam, a lot of people started shifting their energy and suddenly people who were really for gung ho about the war was saying bring our our children home. My father was a state policeman he would fought in the Korean War he has medals and he was angry at me for protesting the war. And then when all of a sudden 
all these wounded young men came back. At that time, the women were um, not specifically there except as medics, and some of them were wounded, but they came home. My father started having a change of heart. And what happened was I was at the University of Kentucky going to be um, getting a degree in social work, to be a, a social worker in the world. And we were marching on campus, one, two, three, four, we don't want your effing war, a um, little leftover from the Woodstock era energy. And that's when Kent State happened. And if those of you, a lot of you are gonna remember that, Kent State, and when the, the young people were killed there. And at that point, my daddy sat down and wrote me a letter because back then it was too expensive to make long distance phone calls. And he sent me a letter and he said, sweetheart, please, I know you're marching. Please be careful and please know that I'm on your side. And I remember sitting down and crying and my parents were so worried they drove up to my hippie apartment and sat on the roof with me and we were smoking some things that weren't legal at that time. But anyway, uh, and my dad was sitting there with us and he just said, I get it. And he still went on to continue to be a police, wonderful police officer. He was always such a humanitarian. He just passed um, in 2020 and at 93 years old. And he was one of the most enlightened, kindest, peace loving men that I knew. He loved Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and all those who have stood for peace. He loved Edgar Casey, um, Peace Pilgrim, all those beautiful beings. So, you know, I think that sometimes we just have to have patience. We have to keep breathing. We have to keep doing our own inner work to clear out the places where we judge ourselves and judge others and keep working towards finding that love and that commonality that deep down we all share. There's one other little thing here, not from my book <laughs> that I want to read, but the Aquarian Shaman, I'll just tell you this, the Aquarian Shaman is just basically a call to all of us to know that inside of us, yes, we are unified. We can be unified in ourselves, the light and the dark. But the external light and dark in the world that you spoke about, the polarities, um, are playing themselves out at a highly intense level right now. And it's creating tremendous birth contractions. And I'm trusting that it's birthing the Aquarian age that's been predicted by the native people, by the indigenous people for millennia, and by the astrologers, by the mystics, by the saints, by the gurus, that we would have a time when we would be forced into um, abandoning this planet and watching everything die, or we would watch things begin to die and we would rally together instead and let it to be an old level of consciousness that is dying and to rebirth a new level of consciousness that's in the cells of our body that are in the imaginal cells of our body so this piece here scott comes from the work you may know mark nepo's work the exquisite risk and i just want to read these two short paragraphs this was given to me by a dear friend of mine jeremiah abrams who wrote meeting the shadow um, and he's no longer on this side, he's on the other side now. But he, told, he gave me this many years ago and printed it out and gave it to me as he was always working with the shadow. The work of love. They say that spirits make music by moving through the breaks in what is living. If so, the work of love is to hold each other and listen. And then he goes on to say, when I was ill, it was easy to separate myself from others as a patient surrounded by caregivers. While this, of course, was outwardly accurate, in the truer moments of my crisis, we actually needed each other. It was hard to tell who was ill and who was well, who was giving and who was getting. In the center of it, we just tumbled in an authentic embrace that saved us all. During those days, I had a dream in which love was the fire and experience was the wood. I have come to understand that it is the loving of experiences that releases the warmth and the light that awaits in each of us. And this is why experience is necessary for living through it. The love 
we are born with becomes who we are. Hmm. And now our time on earth has led me to believe in two powerful instruments that turn experience into love, holding and listening. Hmm. For every time I have held or been held, every time I have listened or listened to, experience burns like wood in an internal fire and I find myself in the presence of love. This has always been so, listening and holding. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask that we all learn how to listen and to hold each other and to be listened to, to draw our beloveds to us who will hold us and listen to us. As a person who's been a therapist, a counselor, a breathwork facilitator in some capacity of listening to others as well as sharing. For I started at 20 and I'm, I'll be 72. So that's, what is that? 52 years I've been listening and holding and being held. I know this to be true. And the core of that is deep, unconditional love for ourselves and others, reconciling the opposites. And Scott, do you want to say something else before I move into um, taking us on a little journey? Oh, well, first of all, thank you for sharing that. And I want to thank your father for being such a good dad and, mm -hmm. and demonstrating to you uh, the beautiful lesson of his willingness to change his belief system. You know, mm -hmm. that's powerful. That's a powerful modeling that he gave to you. Um, and a time that's needed that, you know, we all need to periodically re-examine our beliefs. So God bless your father. And I'm glad he lived to be that long. Wow. Good genes. Good genes. Thank you, Scott. And my mom is 93 and she's still going strong. <laughs> all right. And, <laughs> so, yeah, come from good stock, I guess you could say. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. Well, we're, we're looking forward to experiencing um, so take us on a journey, my friend. Gladly. So I want to invite everybody who's listening in or watching in to um, sit back comfortably because this journey is going to be about a 15 minute journey. And so you want to be comfortable, even if you want to lie down on the floor or lean back in an easy chair, make yourself comfortable. Sometimes people like to turn the lights off or put a little eye mask on or um, but it's just whatever you're comfortable with. And we're going to do a little altered states um, without ingesting anything except the air and love and peace. And so we've gone to another, I have at least gone to another octave of how to um, activate my own DMT, my own pineal gland, my own not hallucinations, but my own altered states of being able to see beyond this world and what's happening at a concrete level and to be able to see what's happening in the cosmos, to see what's happening archetypally, to see what, if you will, gods, goddesses, spirits are calling me or my ancestors and to see whatever is coming up for me to help me continue to do deeper healing in my life which is what I'll be doing to my last breath, transform, transforming myself into the next octave of who I am. And the shamanic breathwork journey ceremony is something that I created um, more than 35 years ago and have written a lot of books about it and shared it with thousands of people all around the world online and in person. So I'm really um, delighted to share um, a few minutes of the journey and the ceremony with you. Usually I begin by smudging and calling in. So I, I already did that at the beginning while we were opening, I already did that. And then we usually give a talk just so that you know uh, how to do this. So in just a moment, the music's going to begin. The music is a little evocative on purpose. And then at the end, it will be soft and it will be some English words uh, that's decipherable calling you back. And when you are going into this journey, just open yourself up, if you will, 
What I like to do is imagine a golden circle of light like the sun around me. And I'll take us in uh, with a little journey to do that. And then with that golden light around you to breathe like this and don't start yet, but like this through your nose and then out and then I can do that three minutes, I mean, three times, and I'm already headed out the door, you know, into space. Some people, it takes a little longer. So what I say to people is breathe like that until you're surprised, meaning that all of a sudden you can feel that liftoff has happened and that you're going to wherever you need to go. Trust the visions, trust your sensations, trust the sadness, the grief, the anger, the disappointment, the ecstasy, the awareness, the bigger picture, the forgiveness, the light, the dark, no difference. Allow yourself to experience whatever's coming forth. That is the shamanic path is to embrace the light and the dark. They both have a lot to teach us. And it's in the integration of that that we discovered the beloved and sacred purpose. So with that, I'm going to ask you to be comfortable now to close your eyes. And I'm going to reach over here and, and take get my drum. I'm going to do just a little bit of drum beat. Sometimes it doesn't come across real well on the microphone, so I'm just going to back off a little bit and do it softly. So with eyes closed, with the golden light of the sun surrounding you, take a moment to call in whatever is sacred to you. And the ascended masters, the creator, Gaia, Mama Earth. And spirit keepers from all directions. And as you're ready, begin your breathing, breathing in and out, in and out, in and out. And the music begins. Have a sacred journey. We'll see you on the other side and back again in just about 15 minutes.
Wherever you are, take a deep breath. Exhale fully and gradually come back. Take a moment to do so. Collecting your experiences. Coming back. Heart wide open. Welcome back. Welcome home. Mm. Oh, thank you very much. I'd love to ask our audience that are in the Zoom room to put in the chat box some of what you've been experiencing. I'll also check the Facebook pages. I see a lot of people are on our Love Coach Academy page today. So... Thank you very much for that. Um, and I'll read some of the experiences that are, some of the comments are already coming in. Uh, Donna writes, that was lovely. Thank you so much. Jeffrey and Sonia write, I could stay here for the whole show. I loved it. Kathy writes, beautiful. David and Carilla write, awakening and energizing. Eleanor Jory writes, very peaceful. And some creative energies flowed throughout. Magic and Maggie write, thank you so much. That was beautiful. Jerry Anderson writes, inspiring music and many memories coming through. Um, uh, Carol Craig writes, maximum grace. Susan writes, spirituality with groove. There's a good one for you. Uh, Danalia writes, oh, can I baby. use that one as an advertisement? <laughs> it's a great, is that a great catchphrase for you? Spirituality with groove. I, like I that. love it. Yeah, Thank that's you. a good one. That's a good one. Um, uh, Krista Michaels writes, A Minute of Wonder. Um, uh, Sage Passy writes, Diving with the dolphins, undulating, and rhythmically breathing. Um, so that is very, very beautiful. Wow. So David and Karela are wanting to know um, what you read, Star Wolf. What was the title and the author of what you read? This is a little paper that my friend Z back in the Xerox days <laughs> uh, took out of a book and but it's um, from a book by Mark Nepo, N-E-P-O, Mark Nepo, The Exquisite Risk, The Exquisite Risk. And then the chapter is The Work of Love. And I'm guessing that The Exquisite Risk is all about, I just have these few little pages I don't have the book, but I'm guessing that the exquisite risk is the work of love, which mm -hmm. is what, of course, you're all about. Yeah. And the, again, it said that this the first little poem there said, they say that spirits make music by moving through the breaks in what is living. If so, the work of love then is to hold each other and listen. It's beautiful. Ah. Uh, well, I want to let people know how they can get much more of you. Um, and so I'm guiding people into your website. Um, and uh, her website is right here. It's shamanicbreathwork.org. Shamanicbreathwork.org. Um, also, Venus Rising is what you see when it comes up. And um, there's a lot of ways you can study with this extraordinary woman. You can become a certified shamanic breathwork facilitator. You can become ordained as a shamanic minister. And you can get a degree from her university, Venus Rising University. Um, and she's got 13 books, including the new one coming out in September. And we'll have you on our Authors That We Love show uh, when the new one comes out again. Um, so... Thank you so much for being with us and getting us off to such a beautiful, beautiful start. Mm. And Scott, thank you. I mean, you are one of my heroes and I just, you know, you and Amashar and everybody that comes on here, you're all so beautiful and so amazing. And just thank you so much, you know, for keeping the faith, especially now, especially now as we're going through the birth canal. Mm. I'm praying that we're going to have a live birth and yeah and that 
we don't shy away from the darkness, that we look into it, that we embrace it, and that we integrate the shadows, our own, and whatever shadows we need to, to clear up within ourselves to create a new world. And I believe that we've got right now, perhaps maybe, at least in my lifetime, um, which is a while, that we really had the opportunity to create this new world that, we're, that we've been dreaming of. Now, thank you for the role you're playing, and it is true. We are creating a, a new paradigm, a new world. Um, however it works, you know, we are understanding through quantum physics that there are multi-dimensions, um, and a lot of the people that, you know, we have on the show talk about the bifurcation, that right now it's like, okay, people are choosing what reality do they want to be a part of, and uh, there's no doubt we are the reality that we've been tuning into it since we were kids and wearing our peace symbols. Um, you know, I think we've all, everybody on this show has signed up for rainbows, rainbows and unicorns. Absolutely. <laughs> right on. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank everybody here. You know, you heard her talking uh, at the beginning about the importance of listening and what a perfect introduction that is to our next guest. Uh, and of course, I'm talking, those of you who know her already know I'm talking about Donna Lea, who has really introduced most of us into what she calls the listening field. Um, and uh, she uh, shared with me, she took me on a little journey, and I went back to um, the orange tree that was in my front yard. And it talked to me, and I realized that she helped me to understand how that tree that I hadn't thought about in 40 or 50 years, actually how it spoke to me uh, as I was growing up and what it did for me. And it was very profound. And so, uh, Donalea, I am so grateful to have you with us again. Um, and you've become really quite a, a most beloved member of our Global Peace Tribe, the Unity Earth community, all the different communities that are coalescing and coming together. So. When I was thinking of who do we want to have a deeper conversation with, I thought, well, it's time to bring Donna Lea back onto the show. Thank you so much, Scott, for having me. You know, it's been uh, an extraordinary day already today. Uh, I'm in Toronto, which was a city I grew up in, and uh, I had the opportunity to introduce a, a group of business women um, to uh, free communication. And so we were right out on the street uh, communicating with this very old maple tree elder. And uh, there were 10, 11 people in the group and uh, every single person received a profound message. One person was decluttering their home and had been experiencing really extreme pain in their legs at night and, and had been to the doctor and was wondering what was going on. And then when she asked the tree elder about this, the tree elder uh, reflected to her that what was the pain in her legs was the old belief systems that were connected with all this cleansing and decluttering she was doing in her home. And shortly after that, the pain disappeared. Wow. You know, another person has been having trouble with their hearing and a really raspy voice. And so when they asked, did the tree elder have a message for them? He started experiencing energy moving up and down between his throat and his ear. And when I checked in with him before we left, he was like, I received a complete healing of what was going on in my ear, in my, in my ears and in my throat. And so I want to tag in in this beautiful um, uh, offering that uh, Linda Starworth um, just kind of keyed up for us. And that is, is it's my experience and my very, very firm belief that in order for us to create a new reality on our earth, we need to be partnering consciously with the nature elders and the nature community who are here. And I know that I'm, I'm speaking to the, the choir here because I know that all of you understand that these relatives, uh, especially the elders, they're sentient, they're intelligent, they're able to communicate and they're willing to communicate. They are simply standing by right here waiting for us to invite them in. We, of course, are a free will universe. They cannot just come in and intervene in what the, we are doing in the human sphere unless we invite them in. 
And so the listening field uh, that you have mentioned, it's a ceremonial space that emerged in 2020 during lockdown. I had been building relationships with nature elders from the Water Rock and Tree Nation from all over the world. And then, of course, suddenly I couldn't travel. And uh, I discovered that based on the trust and the love that we had built with each other, some of them I've been with for more than a decade, um, I could open the ceremonial space, invite them to come in, and they would show up energetically, spiritually, and we could speak heart to heart. So, of course, the listening field has been developing over the last five years. This is our fifth year in 2024. It's a co-creative space. So humans populate it either through a Zoom experience, like we'll do a little bit of today, or in C what I would call in situ, which what we did today when we're actually in physical presence with the nature elders. And for those of you who might be wondering wh who and what is a nature elder, um, it's simply a term that I was given when I asked them, how can I refer to you in a way that is respectful and refer to you as a group? And so nature elder is the term that was given to me. And um, I loosely, it's a subjective term, which means you use it to describe uh, could be a, a river, could be mother ocean, it could be a cloud, it could be fire, it could be a Davic spirit, uh, could be tree, a mountain, etc. So it's just someone that you consider to be wiser um, and sometimes older than you. So a nature elder could also be a younger tree, but who is the lead or 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 um, the, the elder tree of a young grove. So again, very, very subjective. So what I'd like to share with you tonight is that in addition to the private listening field, which is what Scott has referred to, which I do with people who are often needing to make a decision and are having trouble doing that, um, uh, or community groups, we work with community groups who are wanting to uh, uh, protect perhaps a, a forest or, or their local river. So we help them communicate directly with them to make sure that the plans and the strategies that they have uh, put it are, are proposing to put in place are in alignment with ex what the situation is and, uh, and that it is going to ensure the thrival of all. Um, we also work with businesses and organizations similarly to help people communicate directly with those who are involved in producing their products, et cetera. So as you can see, the whole focus in the listening field is to um, bring the human, the humans and the nature people into a conscious, ongoing living relationship so that peace, one of the things that's the biggest focus for, for many, many humans on the planet right now, it's peace with our nature relatives as well as with each other because as we all know, they, they are intertwined together. We can't have one without the other. So in addition to these kinds of listening fields, um, I'm very much on mission in what I call planetary service. And um, after the events of October 7th, 2023, um, when the war began between the Israeli government and Hamas, which continued into the genocide, um, the olive trees began to appear in the listening field. And on an ongoing basis, what soon became clear is that they were offering to partner with us one by one, heart by heart, to teach us what it means to actually be peace, to live peace. And so um, what is happening right now is that every month on the sixth day, I host a public listening field online. Everyone is welcome to attend. The next one is August the 6th. And in this, we call into the field uh, a 4,000 year old olive tree who lives in Southern uh, Bethlehem. And we also call in the deva of the olive trees, the deva of peace, the Kukui trees have actually come forward from Hawaii to say we want to be part of this peace alliance. And then actually another new species, the ginkgo, which are connected with Hiroshima and, and uh, Nuclear Prayer Day, are also um, asking to join. So what I want to share with you is a couple of video clips from the last month's listening field on July 6th. Um, just to give you a little warm up, if, if you will, uh, and then I would like to invite us, you know, guide us into a, an experience where you will be able to consult with a nature elder. 
So I'm going to just share screen and, uh, and um, offer you this first clip. And so just to give you a, a context before I play it, um, this, this woman uh, came into the listening field. She was involved in a facilitation uh, with a place called the Highland Valley and where there's a very large open pit copper mine. And uh, she was asking, uh, you'll hear her rephrase, state her question um, to, the, to the field. Once the field was open, she was asking who would like to come forward to help me with these questions. So as Scott shared, you know, when we do these listening fields and we're going into consultation, we have a group question. And then what happens is, is what a nature elder that you know and love, a tree, a body of water, will presence themselves in your heart. And, and people know then if that nature elder has come to their uh, mind and heart that they want to speak. And so they call them in. In this instance, she felt called to just say who in the field would like to uh, answer my questions. And so you're going to see her refer to an olive tree elder who I met recently in Greece at an event with uh, 35 Palestinian and Israelis and a few internationals like myself, where um, we were exploring our shared connection, trying to trying to 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 discover uh, our shared humanity. And uh, I was there to also help us link with an ancient grove of olive trees. So here's the first clip. And I'm just going to invite you that while you're watching this, kind of notice what happens to your own breath and what happens inside your body. Make sure this is the first one. Yeah, there we go. I asked um, that any of the gathered in the field who wish to answer my question of how I can assist or help in restoring balance to the Highland Valley where there's a massive copper mine and waste rock and tailings. It is entirely full, really. Um, and first came Bee Peace. Um, I think that's the name of the tree. And it was such a sense of humor because it said, Be Peace is my name, and also how you can assist the Highland Valley and the people of that place. <laughs> and then there was this long period of just my body filling with this extraordinary peace, like it's beyond, you know, that peace that surpasses all understanding that term. <laughs> this is exactly the experience which flowed so continuously. you to put in the chat you know what did you notice that happened in your body even as you listen to her sharing well people are writing I'll uh, I'll read some of them as they come in. And I'll share that when she talked, uh, when she mentioned that her name was the same as the tree that came to her, I just got this like, oh, what a, what amazing connection for her. What an amazing, amazing way to immediately know, oh, wow, this is real. There's something really happening here. So that was my thought and my feeling. Um, uh, Carol writes, a big smile and easier breath. Ayata writes, love for the tree coming alive, dropping down in more consciously. Donna wrote, my heart opened when I saw the tree. Morgine writes, I cried and I cried. I could feel and communicate with her. Jeffrey writes, love evolution. Uh, we're coming in. Susan B writes, I saw the great rent in the lower part of the tree and the flourishing of life over this. Sage writes, inspiration. This listening and communication with plants has been a lifelong journey of mine. So there are some of the comments that came in. Thank you. Thank you for reading them. And I, I'm 
I'm sensing as well uh, that you can also feel that the whole field right now uh, in this awakening world, it just got very still and very quiet. And this is the gift, especially of the olive trees who embody peace. And especially I can say that when I was in this olive grove um, and in this valley, I have never, ever, ever experienced peace as I have with these. There were four elders that I had a chance to connect with. And this one that, that you saw, I named being peace because I went inside him and I was guided to just lie down and for two hours I just was in this deeply rooted but deeply connected uh, place of peace. I'm just going to put in the chat a, a, a link to a presentation I did uh, for World Unity Week where you can see and hear a lot more about these olive tree elders and how they helped these Palestinian and Israelis together to heal while they were inside of the tree. And I want to read actually a couple more comments that have come in. Um, Magic, and Mag Magic and Maggie write, we love connecting with the beautiful tree spirits. Thank you for this beautiful experience with olive trees. George Noble writes, this is exactly what I learned by sitting with the many hundreds years old oak tree next to him. I talk to it. I appreciate its amazing stillness and strong vitality, its life force. I have a tent pitched beneath the tree, once tended to by Pomo peoples here on the land, and still a refuge to many species, a barn owl, hawk, squirrel, crow, jay, and others. This oak tree sends love and comfort, which I don't always have inside my cluttered cottage. And Jerry Anderson, one of our beloved members, the wild monk of the Mystic Monastery, writes that he has a tattoo on his leg of an olive branch. So there you go. <laughs> That's beautiful, beautiful, wonderful to hear what is already happening. And, um, you know, what I'm sensing as an interbeing ambassador, as a, a nature communicator, and someone for whom actually the water, rock, and tree people are my primary family and life partners, um, we are actually designed for an even more enhanced communication and co-creative partnership with them. So we're all being asked to, to take our relationship to the next level. And, uh, and, and this, this next clip that I'm gonna share with you is an example of the practical, practical information that the nature elders can give to us. And which is why I really, you know, when people say to me, why, why partner with the nature elder? And I say, well, wouldn't you like to have a wise guide, a trusted friend, right? And or an ally or a colleague, uh, an elder for your business or for your life. And these relatives are always here from, uh, for us, love us unconditionally. And each one of them has a different medicine, a different character, a different voice, etc. So, you know, there's very practical reasons um, how and ways in which these relatives can help us. So I'm going to play the next um, clip for you. And uh, it's just a slightly longer, it's just two minutes. Um, and what you'll hear is the second nature elder who showed up for her. So first, the bee peace tree came in, gave her that message, gave her an experience of, of deep peace. And then this next, then what happened is that the deva of the valley itself came forward and just for though just to be clear is that the olive tree is in physical presence but his spirit showed up to speak to her the next nature elder who came in is the deva of, of the valley who is an who's actually a nature spirit so this is an energetic being and sometimes uh, regarded as the spiritual over 
overarching authority, not so much the boss, but they're like the ones who are connected with all of the olive trees, or in this case, connected to all of the beings that are in the valley and so speaks uh, for her. And again, when I play this clip, I just do invite you to notice like what stands out for you, because that usually what you notice is what is a message uh, or a vibration that specifically um, uh, can relate or be of value for you. Um, so I'm going to just go to the next one. There it goes. So she does, I repeat the question in this segment as well. I asked um, that any of the gathered in the field who wish to answer my question, of how I can assist or help in restoring balance to the Hanan Valley, where there's a massive copper mine and waste rock and tailings. It is entirely full. After that came into the field, the diva of the Highland Valley, who suggested I call on her to specifically support me in writing this report and for key meetings that are upcoming. Um, she then said, all is not lost. The spirit of this land is strong and vital. Balance can be reestablished, though it will look very different from the past. Show me, I said. Then I saw water flowing freely through the valley, which it's really hard for me to conceive because the tailings would presumably all have been removed and put in the pit, <laughs> you know. And uh, the new mountains, these are mountains of waste rock, actual, they're mountains of waste rock, um, are gathering power and presence. They are transformed, but the essence is not lost. I see people in the valley growing food. I see animals grazing, the primarily feral horses and cattle, but also some elk here and there. Then she said, trust that all will be well. The seeds you are sowing will take hold. My gratitude to the Klepamush people of the land for their abiding love. Trust the power of love to move mountains. So what stood out for you? There were three or four messages there. I'm curious what stood out for you and listening. Of course, her emotional experience of the positive vision. That's what stood out for me. Um, and I'll read what's coming in. Um, uh, Scotty Satori writes, our next global water healing. George writes, sweet voice, the sister in the recording. Eleanor Joy writes, the poster of trust, intention and love. Anne Baldwin says, I was filled with hope. Cherry Anderson writes, even the Mother Earth is not a victim. Susan B. writes, the word of trust and her vision is supported. So. Yeah, this is beautiful. And, you know, this example is, I, I said to her afterwards, I said, how did you feel when you saw the scale? Like, this is three copper mines that are, that are together. And then the tailings pond is so full that if it spilled over into the land, it would potentially destroy, right? The ability of the land to regenerate itself. Um, uh, and so she said, I felt devastated mm. uh, by, by that. But after this listening field and actually receiving this vision, she is inspired and and that she has a vision now that can continue to help her mobilize into action. And so one of the things that we're discovering that the listening field helps us do is to tap into new blueprints that we can hold and take action towards manifestation and also communicate to others. So this vision really affected, she said, how the tone of the report 
when she was writing it for the, the people who had hired them to facilitate this. And that the other piece of it is too for us is that if we're given an energetic vision that we're holding, it helps us in when we're strategizing and making decisions as we go along. Because if we know that this is a vision that we have been shown that's come from the nature people, then we can you know more easily and quickly decide, no, that's not in alignment with that vision. So I'm not going to follow that and, and keep centered knowing that as we hold our own missions and our own visions, visions very, very clearly, the universe lines up, you know, to bring us the connections, the people, the resources, et cetera, that we need. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to, to thank Ingrid for her clarity and, uh, and that this kind of um, relationship, ongoing relationship, because she's been calling the data in during the meetings. Um, so then she's uh, taken on this, uh, the data as a partner now with this project. And Donna, I, I'm, I'm really wanting us to, our audience to have an experience of the listening mm -hmm. field. Uh, we're already uh, running late. So can we get to, uh, would you be willing to please lead the practice? Sure. Yes, absolutely. So I'm going to invite you now to just take a moment and um, close your eyes and come into your own heart. And is there a question, a question that you might be struggling with, an issue, or maybe it's even a desire that you would like to manifest, or it could be something that is happening in our world right now. And there is a lot of things that are going on that are very, very, very challenging for us to even breathe through. And so we're gonna call in, I'm gonna open up a, a field and invite you to call in a nature elder uh, to give you some guidance or support with that. And just know that as you uh, hold that question in your heart, um, a nature elder that you already know may appear to you. So therefore they are the one that you're going to communicate with. Um, however, if another one does not sh show up, if a nature elder does not show up for you, then just simply put that request out from your heart, silently from your heart, um, who can help me with, which nature elder is willing to help me with this. And then of course, once you're in this space of heart to heart, you're asking the question, breathing, feeling, and listening for the response. So I'll leave it us in this very... Um, very gently. I'm just looking for my original sound. There we go. All right. So I'm just going to invite you to close your eyes and just come into your breath. Just again, as Linda has already shown us, just gently inhaling through our nose and exhaling through our mouth drop jaw and just letting your awareness drop from your head into your heart and now bring your question or your request also into your heart Beloved nature elders of the universe, those who are here, ready and willing to assist and support, I invite you, those to presence yourself in the hearts of those who are listening, to share your wisdom and your guidance. So if someone has appeared in your heart, in your consciousness, I invite you to send them a wave of love, a wave of gratitude, and feel that being received by them. And then in this place, I invite you to ask your question. Show me, help me, guide me, followed by your request.
Response might come as an image or words, a sensation, or just direct knowing. Now inviting you to offer your gratitude to the nature elder for what you have received. Thank you, beloved, for coming forward. <laughs> We are next in every encounter with human beings. We're filled with love and respect, deep listening, and co-creative joy. So I'm just going to invite you to open your eyes and come back into the room. And if you'd like to put in the chat, if you feel comfortable, what did you ask and what did you receive? And if anybody actually wants to share it on camera, raise your hand using the computer uh, and then you'll go to kind of the front of the, and I'll be able to see you right away. So if anybody wants to open up their mic and make sure you have your camera on and share verbally, I uh, would certainly be happy to hear from you. Um, and I'm going to see if Omashar has anything he'd like to share while others either write in the chat box or raise their hands. Omashar, anything you'd like to share? For me, I'm actually quite surprised because um, it, it, um, I just dropped in to myself more as a result of this listening field. And I did not expect that. And I have a, uh, a favorite tree in England. And it's about 450 years old, and it's a plane tree, P-L-A-N-E tree. And um, I was drawn straight. I wasn't even looking for it. I just asked, went to the question, and the tree came to me. And I was in communication with this um, plane tree next to the River Avon in Stratford-upon-Avon, Stratford Shakespeare's town. And so that was what was up for me. I just felt more present. I felt more in myself. And so thank you for that gift, because I actually needed that. Thank you, Danielia. I, I'm remembering when you came back from England and uh, you had the backdrop where you had I, that tree. I, I did and I do. And um, it's it's an, it's an amazing uh, plane tree. Hey, where has it gone? Um, yeah. So um, so see on, see on the left of me, mm. um, these are massive trees. Um, um, the uh, finger is the size of a person at the bottom of this tree. And so that's that, that tree on the left there, 450 years old, just um, planted at the time when Shakespeare was just uh, doing his thing. So anyway, thank you. And when I took this photo in March of this year, the rainbow appeared behind. I thought, hey, there we go. There's a shot. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great shot. I know, right? So uh, we're going to we're gonna, we're gonna go to Sylvia. Sylvia, I had a feeling that you would have something to share tonight about this, knowing how connected <laughs> to nature you are. Um, yeah, the collage backdrop is of a forest area in a local metro park, um, Sharon Woods Metro Park. And that's where I went when um Daniela issued the invitation um my name moon being of the forest that's you know and so I asked the trees there um one way of putting it is what is my place and how do I get there? Um, and I'm literally, it's a literal question for me because fossil fuel transportation 
is something that I feel we desperately need to move beyond as soon as possible. And the answers were more feelings than they were verbal feelings of being one of them in the forest and a sense of movement in a way that my mind is having trouble wrapping itself around. Sure. So mm -hmm. thank you, Daniela, for holding us through this meditation and for everyone for being part of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sylvia. I'm only going to read, we're way over time, um, yeah. but I, I'm going to read a couple more comments and then let people know how they can get more of you. Um, uh, Roger wrote, I asked how we can help prevent the corporate attack, attack on our farmlands and the forests that are being torched. One thing that came to me is by our vote in support of candidates who are working for our environment, one of whom is Robert F. Kennedy Jr., and to also support the Arbor Day Foundation. Um, uh, and uh, um, George Noble points out, kind of connected, um, that John Mayall, the English blues breaker, passed at age 90 this year, uh, I mean this week. And yes, he was a powerful, powerful being, quite a voice that influenced many of our favorite musicians. Um, uh, Daniela, thank you so much for the wonderful work that you do. Um, people can get much more of her work by going to two places. I'm going to show you two options. Uh, this is her main website, thelisteningfield.com life go to the listening field dot life partnering with nature elders and subscribe to her mailing list so that you can um get caught up on all the wonderful things that she's doing and she also has a wonderful youtube channel um and there's some very very beautiful videos there um again if you just go to youtube and you uh just right into the search bar the listening field and this will come right up um, I'm going to subscribe. And uh, there's some really beautiful stories here that, you know, the more that we listen to other people's stories and it inspires us to open up our own imagination. Um, whoops, looks like we lost on Um uh, It helps us to open our own imagination. And um, so watch the videos, watch the stories of other people and then take the time to tune in and ask the questions and follow the practice that Donalea has laid out for us. It's a it's a very, very beautiful practice indeed. Oh good, she's back. So I'll bring you up one last moment. You disappeared there for a moment. Yeah, thank you, Scott. Yeah, I just want to invite people. August 6th is our next listening field with the olive trees and the ginkgos because it's also a nuclear prayer day. So please come and join us. It is a two-hour experience, so we go much deeper, obviously, into the field. Um, so please come and, and help make this link uh, with peace uh, through uh, and with our nature elders. Do you have a website for that? Is yeah, there... I put in the chat already the listening okay, field great. monthly, and there's the link to register for the Zoom. Okay, and then great. There getting on the mailing list is helpful because we do have a lot of events going on. The website's still under construction. So, yes. yeah, look forward to it if this is a call for you. Absolutely. And of course, Bless August 6th is the perfect timing because that coincides with the anniversary of the atomic bomb yeah. uh, being dropped in Japan. And yeah. so uh, we always honor that time. And there's a lot of events such as Donalea's that's going on. Uh, so, and we're going to be doing um, Fumi. Who, uh, who you love is going to be on the show just before then on The Awakening World um, next Saturday night, a week from tonight, to show you about what she's going to be doing uh, around that time. And we'll also promote Donna Leia's event next week as well. All right. I apologize to our um, presenters. We are running a little bit late tonight, but it's been a wonderful pair of presentations already. And to help us digest all that we've experienced, it's time for Omashar Song number two.
and as we fly again I love the sacred sky Now we are whole again I love the way we've changed the love we are We are rising There's no disguising the truth of who we are When our hearts connected again Now we are the we walk again we know the sacred earth and as we see again to ourselves we give birth and as we feel again We're free to love again Right from the heart of one that we are home and all is said and done light can find its way through all the true ones and broken hearts resolve To the sun of life and the song of life will now be heard by all. We are rising, there's no disguising the truth. That's all Trunkalomashar for that. And I love the lyrics to that song. The lyrics to that song is so beautiful. It is beautiful. And, um, it's one of those songs that just wrote itself, just like Bob Dylan <laughs> says, I don't write them, I just write them down. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Hey, you know, we can get Omashar's music. Um, of course, it's always best to come on Wednesday and Saturday nights to The Awakening World. Um, but you don't have to wait until the next show. You can buy his albums on Bandcamp. And if you go to omashar.bandcamp.com, that's where you will find five wonderful albums all waiting for you. Um, and they're all beautiful. So let's support Omashar. Let's buy his music. And the beauty because... of getting them on this show is that you get all the latest songs before they're even recorded. Right. Right. 
I go in straight to the Global Peace Tribe, and then I think, hmm, I can change this, this, and this. And the song I'm going to play at the closing of this show tonight is going to rock your socks off. Wow. Well, thank you so much. And yes, as you just heard, we will have one more OSR experience uh, to close out the, sh the show. Well, again, the title of the show, Deeper Conversations with People That We Admire. And uh, both of our next guests are people I really, really have a lot of love for. I, I, they're my friends, but they also are really wonderful examples of people that are contributing to our awakening world. Um, and this is the wonderful Magic and Maggie. Um, and so I'll tell you a little bit about each of them. Uh, as a certified intuitive astrologer, um, and she's also an author and a retreat ceremonial facilitator, Maggie has dedicated her life to the sacred, to the expansion of love, the experience of divinity. Her love work is multidimensional and multifaceted. Uh, she guides people in wonderful ways. And something that I really appreciate about her is she's a hospice worker. And that's such sacred work that most people don't make a big deal about. Um, you know, it's like when you think about the great professions, but what is a more extraordinary profession than guiding people out of this world into the next world? So thank you, Maggie, for what you do. And Magic, Magic is someone that I've worked with um, uh, as a shaman. He is a uh, Truly, I call him an urban shaman. Over 25 years, he's been working with people in a wide variety of ways, uh, often taking people out into nature. That are what, that's what I experienced. We went out into Mount Shasta together, and he helped me to connect myself and to nature in beautiful ways. Um, he has a very unique approach to creating and transmitting a powerful field of love and truth. And in that field, anything can happen. Healing happens, awakening happens. He is truly, as his name implies, a magic man. And these two beautiful beings happen to also be a couple. And um, we enjoyed watching you doing the dance, dancing with each other. I actually spotlighted you there for a moment there. Mm -hmm. So it's beautiful to see two awakening and awakened beings coming together in love. Um, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go there first in a question for you. How do you use your relationship uh, to to further evolve, to far, further awaken? Wow. How do we not? <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, I think for, for me, and I, I think, I don't know, you can speak for yourself, but I think Maggie probably shares this uh, sentiment, That's but good. we see the relationship as the primary place to be able to see ourselves. You know, like if I'm sitting alone in a cave meditating, then I don't get to see myself because I'm not interacting with others. And the more intimate the relationship that I have, the more parts of myself that can be hidden from me aren't hidden anymore. So the more vulnerable, the closer I am, the more it gets activated. So I'm grateful that Maggie and I actually have a fabulous harmonious relationship for 95 98 percent of the time however we do have our places where our wounds match where they meet up and we get to see each other uh, through that and then we get to hold each other and heal ourselves and each other and one of the biggest things i've learned in being re in relationship is is to learn that we're a team sometimes I have my hurt from my childhood activated and there's a part of me that gets scared that feels like I'm in my childhood again that projects onto her, my mother, my father, things that happened to me. And then she's likely in that situation having something similar happen to her. And what I think we've both learned is in those situations for me to drop in and, and realize and be with this child part of me and to study that part, bring love to that part, and then to know that something like that's happening for her. And we're here to do this together. We're here to show this to each other and to hold each other in love so we can heal it together. And so it's really, really beautiful to be doing that with Maggie. And most of the time we do it really, really well. And every now and then we 
fumble around like humans and get really triggered. And um, I've noticed that over the years, we just get better and better at coming back to center quicker, staying in love in the first place. And, um, but I expect that it's always going to happen as long as we're humans yeah. and it's, it's beautiful. Yeah, it, it really is really beautiful. The relationship itself, I've never had um, an experience in my life that has drawn me to love myself more than mm. my relationship with magic. It's it's the evolutionary process of relating with one another in such an unconditionally loving way. It it always evolves me in the deepening um, of, of authentic love for myself exactly where I'm at in each moment. And it's it's such a gift to be able to reflect back these parts of ourselves to one another and yet at the same time know that that it's that it's coming from you know when we're wounded or we're triggered it's coming from a place inside of me that needs my love right that needs my attention yeah i think we both are really owning like for example i know that if i get triggered that i'm the one that has a trigger Right. If I have a charge, I'm the one that has a charge. Now, that doesn't absolve her of any responsibility. She might have her part in it. But if I had healed and resolved and loved my hurt and my past and my losses and my wounds, then I wouldn't have a charge. Now, I might still have discernment. I might still have a boundary. I might still have an authentic no. Um, it might still be sad or hurt, but that charge wouldn't be there. And so if I have that charge, to me, it's one of my deeper hurts calling out for me to bring unconditional love to it. And I'm just grateful that we both have that attitude and approach. Mm -hmm. And it makes things a lot easier. It really does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, as a relationship coach, as, as you know, magic, that's uh, what I do. Um, it's so beautiful to see a couple that understand this because... Uh, the deeper the connection, the deeper the soul connection, the deeper the passion, absolutely what comes with it is those issues that our soul wants us to resolve, wants us to work on, also come to the surface. It's, it's the price of admission for being in a dynamic relationship. Um, and so it's beautiful that you understand that and take responsibility and self-reflect um, and, and work with it appropriately. So I'm going to take it a step further because I, I know you two and I can, um, you know, you're, you clearly do have a wonderful relationship. And so when that stuff comes up, and by the way, it may be your own personal stuff or it may be epigenetic because we now know that we're also working on helping to heal our ancestral trauma. Um, what are tools that you use when you do get deeply triggered and, and something that's deep in the shadow, um, a, a shadow, something that you've been trying to maybe hide in the shadows or something that's a deep shame story comes up. What are tools that you use to come back to center and, and use the relationship as a positive sacred mirror? I, mean, I think my tools are kind of specific to me. So for example, I know that I have a sensitivity to feeling like I'm being made wrong or something's wrong with me because I had highly critical parents. So normally, if if I'm having a charge, that's what's getting activated. I think that uh, she thinks something's wrong with me or I think something's wrong with me or I'm getting shame activated. And so one of my primary tools is vulnerability. So it's to share that, it's to, to recognize that that's actually what's occurring and to say, wow, I'm getting scared. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling like I'm something's wrong and I need to just be with myself for a moment. And that's one of the key things that I do and I think Maggie does too, is to pause what's happening and to take the space to bring myself the connection and love to even know what's happening for me and be able to articulate it. And I actually, I talk to myself. I, I sometimes say, magic, you're not doing anything wrong. You're a human. It's okay that you have a wound. It's okay that maybe you've actually done something that you wish you would have done differently, but there's nothing wrong with that. You're human 
and it's okay. Your love, and I give myself love. And then that calms me down to be able to actually interact with what's really here rather than my childhood wound that's flared up. And another thing that I think we both do really well is, um, and we're consistently improving on it, is naming that part of us, right? Like I know for me, I know that magic is very sensitive to being made wrong. So I will try to be sensitive to that in my trigger and I will name that I have a child part that's up and that I'm feeling identified with that child part right now. And that, you know, I, I understand from a cognitive perspective that this is mine, but in this moment I'm identified with that part. So really it's not an, it's not a, a, um, it's not a useful time to speak about anything if I'm feeling identified in the moment, right? So the we have particular challenges that some of your audience, I suspect, might relate to, because we're both highly psychic beings. So Maggie might might be really doing a great job of talking to me calmly and collectedly and not raising her voice. And, and in her world, not actually transmitting the uh, feelings that she's having inside, right? She's taking a very mature approach. And this happens both directions, by the way. But, you know, I'm very psychic. So I can feel the part of her that might be making me wrong. Because she's got this mature part that's really in control in that moment. But she's got this child part that might be making me wrong because it's a child part, right? And it's hurt. And I can feel all of it. So we've had to learn how to navigate that there's a lot of levels of what we're both feeling and to name them and navigate them. So, you know, I can say, you know, I know you're doing the best you can, but I'm actually feeling the part of you that that is making me wrong. And I'm trying to be OK with that because um, I know you're doing the best that you can. And then I'm being with the part of me that is afraid to be wrong and that is feeling my self-esteem is on the line and my self-value. And so it gets complex when you're psychic. And I'd imagine some of your audience might relate to that. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, next question for you. Since we did the listening field and we've tonight, there's been a lot about connecting to nature and magic. I've gone out into nature with you and I know you lead nature experiences some of the things you can share and, and as personal as possible of um, moments where you've spoken to nature or where nature has really helped you maybe uh, when you were in a challenging time in life. And that's a question for both of you and maybe start with Maggie. Yeah, um, I'd love to share. You know, Magic and I just completed, we just um, co-facilitated a retreat in Mount Shasta together for seven days. And there were many people who had absolutely stunningly beautiful experiences in nature when we were there, including myself. And um, I, because it's the, my most recent um, story about a, a wonderful transmission and healing in nature, it's the one that I'll share, but I, I, on a very regular basis, go out and connect with the earth. And it's, it's my way of seeking my own um, healing and growth is being, um, out connected with the land. So we were in Mount Shasta um, last week, and it was our final day there. And I had, I've, I've always had a very strong connection with, um, with bees. And I've had incredible encounters with bees, especially at Mount Shasta, where I've, I, I once had a, um, a bee fly onto my heart center and then fly in front of my face and make prayer hands at me. Um, and then fly on my third eye. And I've, I've had just countless, countless encounters with bees. And um, I, I, was, I was working through some, some childhood things last week at our, the very end of our time in Mount Shasta as it can be catalyzing there with all of this really strong sacred energy and energetic vortexes. And I was, was working with some deeper emotional patterns and um, when I was in a, a, a very beautiful spot um, on the mountain in Panther Meadow, I had um, St. Germain come to me and the bee spirit. They let me um, know in that moment, and this 
I, I kind of received the message that the bee was my spirit animal. And I, I, my whole life, I have never felt like I had a spirit animal, even when we were on retreat, I was sharing with some of the attendees that I, I didn't feel like I had a spirit animal that I'd identified with different animals, but I'd never felt that depth of connection. And in this moment, in this meadow in Mount Shasta, it all came in and was deeply, profoundly healing to me. And and I, I, it was like, I, in that moment, I knew that the universe had been trying to tell me about this deep connection with the bee spirit for so many years. And it had continued to kind of go past me until this, this really profound moment. So it was, it was my, my last really deep, profound moment out in nature. And it just has solidified that connection with that beautiful animal spirit even more. And, um, and the messages continue to come in around it now as I'm as I'm integrating that into my system. So it's really beautiful. Well, my bee sister, I, I don't want to go into the whole story, but um, a long time ago, I had the experience of being stung. I was attacked by um, a swarm of uh, yellow jackets and was stung somewhere between 35 and 50 times. And I was to be honest, I was on mushrooms at the time, but thank God I was with um, a Native American woman who turned it into an initiation into the bee kingdom. And, and none of the sting, like none of the stings, because she did it that way, none of them bothered me after it was over. I had a whole psychedelic experience of becoming a bee. Um, and so I have two spirit animals, one of which is the bee. So there you have it. Last story about that. Um, a few years later, I was visiting a friend of mine and her daughter, who had never met me before, answers the door. I'm knocking on the door. The daughter answers. The daughter's about six years old. And she goes, you're a bee. You know, man, you're a bee. So that kind of anchored it in. So anyway, uh, here's to bees as our totem animal. Magic, I'm eager to hear your story. Well, I'm having a hard time sorting through all the different stories because, you know, the retreats that Maggie and I facilitate, you know, what we do is emanate a field, an energy field, what I call a shamanic container in which we attempt and usually do a pretty good job of helping people to dissolve all of their illusions of separation and open up an experience of multidimensionality where a lot of people have a psychedelic or ayahuasca type experience without any substances. And of course, in these states, people talk to trees and talk to rocks and have healings. And so regularly on every retreat that we have, there's a healing like this. Just on the one that we just led, there was a man who was so debilitated by digestive issues for his entire life that all he could eat was meat. We had to have the caterer just bring meat for him for all of his meals, if he had anything else, he would get very, very ill for days, weeks, or even months. And we went to some healing waters and he was guided to dip himself in the water. And while in the water, he heard, you're healed. And he came out of the water and he felt different, talked different, thought different, acted different, and began eating waffles and ice cream and all kinds of things and, and didn't get sick. He was immediately healed. There was another person who had a bulging disc, a herniated disc in their back who was going to cancel coming on the retreat because they couldn't even get in their vehicle without being in so much pain. But they somehow made it. They had an experience with a stream in which they got into freezing cold water. The water immediately became warm like a hot tub. And then they felt like all of this history, conditioning, past lives, genealogical, just emptying out of their body and got out of the water and their back was perfectly healthy. Mm. Um, we had somebody with cancer on the retreat before the last retreat that was going to have an operation before the retreat. She went in nature, again, an interaction with water, healed her cancer. It just disappeared. And when she went back to the doctor, no need for surgery because it was completely gone. Wow. But I'd say my personal, because you asked for personal experience, my, my most powerful experience that came to me was an intimate one that I don't share much publicly, but in 2007, uh, I studied with a very, very intimately with 
quite a few radical shaman kahuna sorcerers that you would see in like a Harry Potter movie, people who could walk through walls and shape shift and teleport and aren't public figures and, and apprenticed me very deeply. And one thing they all had in common was this ability to transmit the frequency of what they were sharing so that the receiver, the listener, the audience would actually have something evoked inside of them and would be altered or changed just by listening or just by being in the field. And as I studied with them and practiced this, I felt like I was getting okay with it, but hadn't quite mastered it yet. And one day I was on Kauai, some elders had taken me to this sacred site and there was this tree called the kissing tree in this sacred site. And it had eyes and a face and a mouth that looked like it had lipstick and it was gonna kiss you. And I sat on this rock and this was actually the second time I went to the tree alone with my shaman friend. And I just started to eye gaze with the knots on the tree that looked like eyes to me. And I just held the gaze of this tree for a long time until suddenly everything disappeared. And the world was just like dots and specks and white light and this, <clears throat> this spiraling light energy started coming out of the tree and right into my third eye. And then I wasn't there anymore. I was, there was no me. There was, I was feeling everything you could ever feel in the world. And it felt like my entire system, every cell, every part of my body was being activated. I was shaking and vibrating. I was crying at times. I was howling and screaming at times. It lasted about 45 minutes. There was one moment when I had like my ego personality was present and I had the thought, what is happening? And the tree told me that it was actually, and I don't remember the exact words of the tree, but the gist was it was awakening inside of me that which was needed for me to be able to transmit in a way similar to my teacher. And it was so radical. And afterwards I, I laid down on the ground. I couldn't move. I couldn't talk. I was like drooling. It took probably 45 minutes to an hour to get up and walk. And that moment was a defining moment in my life because after that, how I taught, how I led retreats, classes, one-on-one -on -one work all changed dramatically. And it was so humbling that this beautiful tree could help like bring this online in me and bring me like able to help people on such a deeper level. And so, um, it wasn't the one I expected to share, but it's certainly one of the most meaningful to me. It's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Wow. Thank you for the beautiful work you're doing, helping so many people. Um, do you have any retreats coming up that people can consider, get excited about? We do. Um, we have a retreat. Well, we have a retreat in Mount Shasta that we haven't quite selected the dates yet, but it's another seven day shamanic awakening retreat in which you know, it's a field of what we call both the shamanic and the mystical. So the shamanic is the ability to manifest and navigate the third dimensional human reality in an elevated way. It's blaming the psychic senses on knowing what's going to happen, telepathy, shape-shifting, these kind of cities, they call them in the East, to help navigate humanity better. And also unconditional love to help deal with what it is to be a human with emotions and loss and all those things. And then we have the vertical, which is God and divinity and oneness and emptiness and being in the void. And it's also unconditional love, which bridges both. So these two are seemingly paradoxical and these retreats are the place where both of them meet together. And so we have a seven day retreat coming up in Mount Shasta. We'll have the dates on our website soon. We also likely have a retreat coming up this winter in the Azores. So Mount Shasta and Hawaii are a part of the ancient civilization known as Lemuria. And then over in the Atlantic Ocean is the Azores, the Hawaii of the Atlantic. And that is the place of Atlantis. And so that's coming up as well. And then we both do custom retreats in Mount Shasta and Hawaii, sometimes other places that can be completely customized for you. So it can be you, it can be you and a friend, a couple, a family, a business retreat. And, you know, you just get in touch and we, we can customize it for you.
Beautiful. Maggie, what are some of the things you most enjoy about the retreats? Is there anything you want to add about kind of the magic that the two of you create together? Yeah, it's really beautiful, the container um, that that we hold with one another. You know, um, magic is, is he's such this beautiful um, example of someone very embodied in their divine masculine. And it, it really allows me to be in the feminine and hold the container from the feminine place. And I think that those who attend our retreats really feel that. You know, we get a lot of people calling us mom and dad <laughs> and and, uh, and we're, we, we hold a really safe, loving, um, a really, really beautiful container. The kind of mom and dad that they want to have. Yeah. Not, yeah. Not yeah. Right. They probably have. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, as we're encouraging the, you know, the, the coming online of their own inter, like inner parenting, reparenting skills for themselves, becoming their own beautiful divine mothers and divine fathers to themselves. We're holding the container and the space for that. So seeing the people who attend our retreat really start to embody that for themselves, the way of nourishing and nurturing themselves, the way that they always desired to be nourished and nurtured from that outside themselves, originally their mother, and then as they grew other people in their lives. And same, you know, with that energy of that, that divine father, that holding the container for themselves, holding their foundations and providing themselves the devotion and discipline and structure needed to expand in their heart to get to know those deeper parts of themselves to hold space for themselves in the beauty and the light and in the dark and the shadow and the, the pain and the trauma that comes along with being a human so really seeing people own that to a new level and and be able to have these absolutely like quantum leap in consciousness type of moments where they have these profound healings profound knowings downloads come in i mean it's just magical what can happen in these these containers and and seeing the um the incremental and the absolutely you know quantum leap profound type of healings but both of it is just really rich and deep and i i'm just so grateful to to be be able to witness that it's it, it really fills my heart i want to just add one more thing if i could scott do you mind yeah please do i, I just want to say that I mean, I think you know, Scott, that that my my commitment in life, my 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 one singular intention is to is to realize and be the unconditional love that I am in every moment, to to love every part of me and everything and everyone in every moment. And and my life is dedicated to doing that. And and you know, there's all this shamanic and all these different things that that come with that, but but that's really what it's about for me at the deepest level is finding every part of me that I don't love. And bringing unconditional love to that, and Maggie is a person that I I so admire because she's embodying and living that and has that same commitment, and that's ultimately the the space that we're creating on the retreats is a space of unconditional love which dissolves, resolves, and heals all of the illusions of separation that we are anything other than one, and in that literally anything is possible unconditional love heals any distortion anything that has us being anything of than who we really are and so every retreat there's like somebody that comes with like a terminal disease or something radical that gets healed and it's not just physical things it's people creating their soul we had somebody on this last retreat who came on a excuse me came on a retreat 14 years ago having failed relationships their whole life in their 50s and finally wanted their their soulmate and created that within one month after the retreat and brought that person on this retreat last week after 14 years of marriage. Mm -hmm. And it's every category, every retreat, each person is having literally what seems like a miracle because of the love. And it's it's easy to say to love yourself but actually how to palpably do that in a way that actually does unconditionally love yourself is something I don't see out there too much in the world. And it is something that we do teach people how to embody and hold a container 
in which it occurs and it's just beautiful and, and, I, and I love it and just had to make sure to, to, to mention that because especially with being here with Maggie it's one of the things I love about leading a retreat with her is that we're both now coming from that place and I've met very few people who are really holding that commitment to loving themselves every part of themselves and not spiritually bypassing which is when we take the feeling of love and we put it in place of something that we don't like that's very different than actually totally loving the thing we don't like, which actually often makes it feel more intense at first because we're giving it permission to be there. Beautiful. I am absolutely delighted to see the two of you together in your glory. Uh, this is a little postcard that they sent to me. Uh, I've put it in the chat box, but for everybody watching on Facebook and YouTube, a lot of people watching on um, Facebook and YouTube tonight. Um, and you can see some of the, the joy of the people um, that are participating in your retreats, and I highly recommend it. Um, and a reminder that the best way to uh, learn about what Magic and Maggie are up to is to go to the website, and their website is sacredvoyages.com. Sacredvoyages.com. Look at all those happy sacred voyagers. Um, and that's where you can learn more about what they've been talking about, both the custom retreats that they can do for an individual or a couple or a family or the group retreats that they do. Um, and uh, again, I've, I've known Magic for a long time. Then when I saw him get together with Maggie, got to know her. They're the real deal. They are a wonderful, wonderful pair of human beings that provide a lot of love and a lot of goodness. So... Thanks, Scott. And I just want to put in another little plug for Maggie. Mm -hmm. She's a master astrologer and the most incredible astrologer that me and everyone I've ever referred to her has met. And so I just want to put it out there as well. Her astrology is like no other. It's very practical. It's very uh, real. It's very positive. And it really gives you information about what you can do that can actually change your life based on your astrology in this moment. And frankly, I didn't believe in it as much and wasn't so into it until I met Maggie. And she's told me so many things that have blown my mind. So, um, and you have a website for that? I do. Yeah. It's just, it's my name, MaggieAnnEngel.com. I will, I'll go there. And while I'm going there, let me pull it up. And while I'm going there, curious, do you have any astro astrological insights about what's happening politically, since it's obviously a lot's going on the last two weeks. A lot of things have changed. Uh, well, anything you can share about that? Yeah, I can give a, 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 I'll try and keep it brief, but yeah, absolutely. So um, last week, amidst a lot of the, um, a lot of the drama in the outside world politically, we had a very, very um, profound uh, energetic kind of gateway. We had Mars the planet Mars, which is passion and action and masculine energy, conjunct the planet Uranus, which is frequency or vibration. It's where the collective is moving. You know, Uranus's only goal is to raise the frequency of Mother Earth and Taurus right now. And they were on the fixed star Algol, which there's a lot, a lot written out there about Algol, and I won't get too in depth with that energy, but that energy really was inciting us to be with the parts of ourselves that we and the parts of life the parts of being a human, the parts of humanity that are ugly, that we don't want to look at, the shadow parts, because that is where we gain our deepest empowerment is through our ability to be with all that is real and all that is present to be with what's true. And the energy continues to push us in that way. We have Neptune at 29 degrees of Pisces, and it's, it's, only um that's like the 29 degrees of pisces is like the god point it's the top it's the um last degree in the entire zodiac so it's our closest connection to source but it's also our deepest karma and dharma and so we're we're having a, an ability as a collective society right now everyone on the world in the world has the ability to uh, transcend their karma at this point in time in a way that we will never have again in this lifetime. It's it's a really profound um, portal of energy that we're in that is really allowing us to shift patterning, right? Karma is just patterning that we repeat as souls. So we have a really, really deep, profound opportunity to move out of patterning, all while we're kind of being incited to be with that, which is hard to be with. 
with the shadow, with the, with the difficulty, it's all up for us to love exactly what magic was just speaking about, not the bypassing of the things that are hard, the looking above them, going above them, putting them down, putting them away. It's the actually being with the things that are hard to be with. And that's what the energy is pushing us towards. So anything that we see in our inside of us that we're having difficulty with, uh, with, you know, any emotional patterning that we're having difficulty with inside ourselves, anything outside of us in our relationships or on the collective world stage is all for us to be with right now, because we have a profound and massive ability to, as we meet everything we see with love, with profound love, we are able to transmute that energy, to alchemize it, to integrate it, and to move on into patterning that is more in alignment with what our souls want to expand more into, which is the love that we are. So, go ahead. So, so the most important thing right now is to actually be with your shadow. Like there's a time for shadow work and there's a time for just being the light and the love and divinity that you are. And this is a time for both. Yeah. It's how can we be our divinity and be our shadow at the exact same time? And this is very nuanced, subtle work that most people could use some support with. So if you know somebody that knows how to help you love yourself further, to be with yourself, to be with the parts that are uncomfortable and challenging, there isn't a better time than right now to take that time to really love yourself and be with yourself. I have a technique that I teach called the oneness method. And it is the method of how to do this. It is a tangible, practical way to get in touch with that which is uncomfortable and to love it and I actually have a couple of free talks about it on my website if you go to sacredvoyages.com and you click on magic talks which is my podcast and then you go to the library there's a bunch of free talks there on zillions of topics and that there is at least one and i think more than one on the oneness method and i highly recommend that at this time right now um it's uh see where it says listen to recorded talks scott yeah, in the middle right there. It's it's just such the time to really deeply be with yourself. And Here they are how beliefs create reality and how to change them. Power of Mount Shasta, a lot of shamanism, mystical powers. I'm just reading words that are jumping out at me. Attracting your soulmate, repelling your wound mate. Um, and you certainly are, you know, providing There's a demonstration. The Stop right there, Scott. Scroll up slightly. And it says the oneness method make 2022 the year of your dreams. So mm -hmm. I don't remember what's in that one specifically, but that might be one that would be really good to listen to at this time. Okay. Or one of the other ones that talks about that. And then there are specific ones below there that talk about sadness. If you're, if that's one of the things for you or fear mm -hmm. or anger specifically. And then there's another oneness method, one down there in the lower middle, one technique for spiritual and material intentions, um, finding the greatest love you. There's another one about how to love yourself. Magic, these are beautiful. And these are all such, I'm so glad we're looking at this. I did not know you had done so many of these podcasts and they're all the top. These are the topics that people need support with. So this is beautiful. Absolutely yeah, really beautiful. try to um, to download whatever feels ripe in the moment each month. The one coming up um, in August is, is your meditation really doing what you want it to be doing? There's something like that. I don't remember the exact title, but we use that word meditation to mean so many different things. And is the one that you're doing actually doing what you want it to be doing? Or is there some refinement or difference that you might want to uh, adjust? To your meditation so i'll talk about lots of different types of meditations and what they do and what they don't do and it feels like also a really important one right now as we're going more inside and it's important to go inside beautiful thank you for all that you provided that's really an amazing set of gifts i also want to bring people back to maggie um and to her website um because you gave a beautiful uh, and unique astrological readings. We gave people a little homeopathic dose of Maggie astrology. Um, and so for a full meal of Maggie, um, you can book a session. Just go to her website. It's Maggie Ann Engel. And there's a, so it's Maggie 
Ann, A-N-N, Engel, E-N-G-E-L.com. You can book a session. You can also learn more about her form of intuitive astrology and transformational coaching. So here they are, two of my favorite people, two of the most gifted people I know, and I'm so grateful that you are uh, spending your Saturday night on The Awakening World. Thank you so much. Thank you, Scott. I love you. So grateful to be with you as always. So appreciate you and appreciate being on the show. Yeah, look forward to seeing you soon. Hey, how are you guys making out? There's a lot of fires going on up there right now. You guys okay with the smoke? It's clear here right now. Okay. Um, it's, it's kind of gathering a little south of here. Well, the whole time we were in Shasta, thank goodness, um, for 10 days it was clear. Okay. And then we're leaving for Maui tomorrow. Oh, wow. All right. Well, we could say you're here today, but gone to Maui. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. Thank you so much, Scott. Yeah. Thank much you so love. much. Love you guys so much. Uh, it's always a treat for me to bring people that I love so much onto the show. Um, all right. Well, speaking of people that I love coming onto the show, we have a very unique uh, opportunity to see another side of one of our favorite people, one of our favorite global peace drivers. Who is that man in the black hat? I don't know. Um, anyone got a mirror? <laughs> now, my understanding is that you are, this is a different name. This is not, this is not the normal Andrew Cameron Bailey. I am now looking at I'm I'm one of those schizophrenic types. I've got lots and lots of different personalities. I've decided to assign names to some of them. And um, I now call myself Jack. So you can call me Jacko. And um, the name Jacko Spades, you may have uh, seen a deck of playing cards. Well, Jacko Spades is a very, very significant um, member of that deck of playing cards and i'm not necessarily playing with a full deck as you may have noticed so however i am playing music and the baby that scott you were referring is babies tend to be very small and this one is very small when i share my screen you'll see it's literally tiny it's an experimental digital distribution system for music now I don't know if you know this, Scott, we met in Santa Cruz about 15 or 17 or 18 years ago at um, Angela and Alleluia's place. Um, I have a long history in Santa Cruz and Santa Cruz is where I really started my musical career and became a part of an experimental band that was wild called the 25th Century Ensemble. It was completely, completely nuts. It was really fun because you didn't actually have to be a musician to be a member of the band. Um, it drove a lot of people crazy. It also produced some of the strangest, most interesting, very, very unpredictable music that, that I've ever heard and that most people have. Um, I ended up producing a lot of music. I became rather than I was writing songs and I was interested in that, but I never really thought I'd be able to be a musician or have a band or any of those things. So I got involved with bands as anybody ever hear of the humans from Santa Cruz, California. They were a pretty big deal for a while. We did two national tours. The first record I ever produced was down in Monterey at um, a beautiful recording studio called Super Sound. And um, it's called I Live in the City, City as opposed to City. Now these days we'd, um, we'd Hinduize it and call it I Live in the City because we all live in our cities. But, um, and that's a joke. Um, point being, I've done a lot of music over the years and the baby that um, Scott was suggesting that Connie and I had after much striving managed to produce this little person. I do want to say that I have produced a bunch of babies. I home birthed my five children and on my youngest son's 44th birthday, which is coming up on August 1st, I'm actually dropping this record, this song that I'm giving you all a sneak preview of this evening. It's a song for America. It's a song called America. The title is America. And it is aimed very directly at the heart of what is going on right now in the sense of from a healing perspective from looking back at our history now i'm not american it is this is my adopted country but it's a song from 
just from the heart and from the soul. So I'll be sharing that in a minute. And when I share my screen, you'll see it doesn't fill the whole screen because it's a baby. It's little. It's called an SDS, and that stands for Secure Digital Single. It's my personal invention. Do you remember the little 45 RPM records that we all used to buy back in the day? I mean, sure, I, I remember bunch, that, yeah. I put out a bunch of them with my brother and with various other people. You'd have an A side and a B side, and my brother would do a, a side, and I'd do a side, and we put out a single. And then I produced an album in Santa Cruz called Surf City Underground, which had was a compilation that had 16 songs by 13 different unsigned bands, stuff like that. Um, just a whole lot of fun, a whole lot of education and uh, really close to my heart. And then all through the 90s, I had a band in um, the Hamptons and New York City called Deja Voodoo. Deja Voodoo is a, a term with a meaning. Firstly, the music was based on authentic voodoo rhythms from West Africa. We actually had a voodoo priest teaching us these rhythms. And it was an experimental band that combined Western instruments with African authentic 2,500 year old authentic African rhythms. So that's a whole adventure that I don't think anybody in this group knows about at this point. <clears throat> Deja voodoo means you are absolutely certain that you've never been here before. So this is, um, that's what that one means. And what has just recently happened, I think most of you know, Connie and I went to Australia for three months at the in the earlier part of this year. And I came across something in Australia, which is interesting. There's a very powerful element of AI, artificial intelligence involved in it. It is a the best description, it is a virtual recording studio in the cloud. Now I've spent a lot of money and a lot of time on and in recording studios, hiring musicians, hiring engineers, picking up the tabs, paying the bills to produce music, to manifest a song. I have produced of my own material, I don't know if it's 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 songs in the studio at great expense. I've never made much in the way of money from it. Deja Voodoo was actually quite successful, but it was an eight-piece band. There was no way we could afford the recording studio. So enough of that. What happened in Australia is I was introduced to this phenomenon, and I think it emerged from West, West Australia, maybe Perth. It is a situation where you can go online into this. Um, Omishar actually came over to the studio here in Loveland, Colorado, and sat with me, so he knows what I'm talking about. You can have an idea for a song and you've got to have your act together. Now, it being AI, it'll make a song. You could press a button and get, a, get some stuff, right? It's not like that if you know what you're doing and if you know what you're looking for. So this is a breakthrough that has been created to promote music, to promote creativity in the world of music. It is completely designed, developed, and supported by major musicians and executives in the music industry. It's really interesting. And the quality is breakthrough superb. So I'm also a novelist and I am a story writer, aside from being a songwriter. So I have created a fictitious character based on this guy you're looking at right here. This photograph of me, as you will see, I've fed it into AI and um, made a CD cover for myself. So you'll see the fake me, whose name is Jack, Jack of Spades. And I've got a whole story about him. I know exactly what he did from the, I know what his daddy did before he was born. I've got the whole backstory of him. He's got an album that's ready to, ready to he's got, what does he have right now? 16 songs, I believe. Um, you're about to hear the first of them. I'm gonna drop one song a month, at least over the next coming period of time. And, um, Let's go ahead and I'll share my screen. And um, this, I'd love your feedback on this. I am hoping that this will hit the heart of America and help us to remember what the vision was about the, this country, what the potential is of this country that is yet to be manifested. And at this point, a lot of people in this country need a very big reminder of what this country is really all about, because I think it's the most dangerous moment in American history, I also think it's the most dangerous moment in human history. 
So here's a song. Now, a lot of Jack O'Spade songs are tongue in cheek. Some of them are really funny. Many of them are deeply philosophical because that's two sides of me. And um, let me share my screen and let's see what we can do here. Let's see. This one? This one up here? You sure? Double click. So we'll click what? No, we won't. Mm -hmm. I mean, what I want to do is. Okay, there we are. Uh huh. So there we are. See, there's meet meet Jacko Spades. You can call him Jacko. And um, he can really, really sing. He can sing a lot better than I can because the remarkable thing about this system is that. This does not violate anybody's copyright. It is not any particular individual. It is a creation that is made from whatever the pixels of music are. We know what the pixels of, of video, of visual images are, but what are the pixels of music? Somehow this is able to assemble this and I'm able to control it. I wrote every aspect of the lyrics. I did all of the arranging. I'm actually the producer here of a vision. And as you can see, the song's called America. And if I move my cursor over to see what happens, I hit play and we'll be able to listen to the song. So here it is, friends, America. And this is a world premiere sneak peek preview. Please enjoy. In the year of our Lord, 1620, they came seeking freedom to a land of plenty With hope in their hearts on a desolate shore The pilgrims landed, never been here before America, America, the land of the free Have we strayed so far from liberty? In the echoes of history, can we find our way? America, I beg you, don't let the dream decay. Chains and sorrow in the shadow of sin slave fields in the south and our conscience within brothers turn folk in an uncivil war freedom for all a heavy burden we bore america america where we all pay the cost in the blood of the fallen have we finally lost in the echoes of history can we find our way america i beg you don't let the dream decay In the trenches, on the beaches, from Dunkirk to the Pacific, we fought against darkness, our intention quite specific. In the fight against fascism, no matter how long, the heart of our nation stood united and strong. America, America, you know wrong from right. We stood together. In the darkness of the night In the echoes of history Can we find our way? America, I beg you Don't let the dream decay Fight for freedom, we've made it this far. 
In the echoes of history, we can find our way. America, I beg you, don't let the dream decay. Wow. <laughs> That's a lot of fun. Uh, who's playing guitar? That's some really good guitar licks. It's very hard to tell because it's actually AI. It's AI. Isn't that incredible? Now, That's my amazing. partner in this project is my brother, Steve, who's known as Steve Bass. So he's on there playing some acoustic guitars. Okay. Um, he is a bass player, but he's not actually playing bass in here because he thought it was just fine. But he is a he used to have the only country western band in London through the 80s and 90s, a band called Dark Horse. Then he met an American girl, moved to Miami, got married and moved to Miami, where he has a recording studio and he's a much sought after bass player and um, singer songwriter and record producer and does really beautiful work. And he, he he's my mastering engineer. And so we, at why me, this guy doing um, country western, I was really puzzled. I never got into it. I'm, I'm a Brit, right? So right. I'm into Beatles and Stones and stuff. And um, I asked him once at his studio in London, I said, what is it? And he played me something. He said, listen to this. He said, what, what, what hits you about it? I said, well, the quality is superb. He said, that's the point. National, national music is so superbly engineered played performed and so on so this is literally in my opinion natural quality and it was done in the cloud amazing amazing well we are 45 minutes over yeah. our agenda time yeah. um but ayata has something she wants to share okay uh, i just got to say really fast andrew this is one of the best songs i've ever heard and so timely and can we start sharing this because i <laughs> i'm going to get this out there to a lot of people if we can or, or when you're ready to share it but i mean so timely and powerful thank you oh, thank, thank you thank you so thank much. you may this song go the far away the release date is august the 4th and it's going to be purchasable for very that little thing you saw there it's a little thing that you can actually buy because we need to raise some money for our films. That's a whole other story. But we've now got 20 songs and I'm going to start releasing them and see if we can get something rolling here. Mm -hmm. Andrew, as soon as you've got the link for where people are going to put that link into the chat box, please. And then um, on our show a week from now, I'll uh, present it again as well. And the website, I literally started working on the website yesterday because I've been working on music like a minute. Get it, get it to us as soon as you can, and we'll uh, remind everybody about it next week, okay? Yeah. Thank you, Scott. Absolutely. Thank you, Andrew. We love you very much. Thank you so much. Wow. All right. Well, I want to thank David and Karila for hanging in there. Uh, it's been a great show, but it's gone really, really long. Um, so thank you for being with us. And here are our next guests. Um, and David is someone that I've known for quite a while. We're part of the Unity Earth community. Um, and he shared recently, I think it was at the Unity Earth meeting, where I learned about what you're doing. And I realized, oh, wow, our, our Awakening World audience needs to know about that. And then he asked to bring his partner, Karila, on. So welcome to you both. Thank you for being a part of um, the Awakening World. Briefly, uh, to introduce Karila, uh, Karila is a channel and a land worker. What a beautiful combination. Dedicated to being of service to humanity at this time of immense change and transformation. Well, welcome, because that's what this show is all about. Um, and uh, during a sacred site journey in 2019, her guide started to speak about the prayer ceremonies that were used in ancient times to keep the peace. And so now she's bringing that inspiration into the work that she's doing with David. Um, and so it's very, very exciting. And uh, with no further ado, please tell us about what you are creating and how we can all support it. Oh, and I should mention, David is an author. Uh, he's the author of Subtle Activism, the Inner Dimension of Social and Planetary Transformation. That's a mouthful. 
Uh, he's currently working on an astrologically informed column on Substack um, called Ge Geistic Musings. Uh, he's, he's also the co-founder of the Guy Field Project and Be the Peace. Um, and many of you know him from the Be the Peace movement. That's where I think I first met you. Um, and with his wife, Kate Naga, he's the co-founder of Earth Rising, a global platform dedicated to seeding the energetic infrastructure of this emerging era on Earth through symphonic group consciousness. So that's a lot that you two are doing. I said the words, please now explain it to our audience. Well, thanks so much for having us, Scott. And this show is just amazing. I, mean, I feel so lit up by everything we've experienced here together. Um, anyway, we're here on the Gold Coast in Australia, which is actually where I was born, uh, actually on the Gold Coast. Um, and we're on our way to Uluru with a, a, a small crew, 20 people. And when we're there, <clears throat> we're going to be convening an event we're calling Earth Prayer. And it's a 48-hour uh, global prayer ceremony. The way it works, I, I learned this technology from Kirilla. Um, and so I'll have you explain it in, in depth. But we, we open with a Zoom call to see all the prayer keepers and to create the field to open the field <clears throat> and then during the 48 hours each person signs up for an hour and 11 minute prayer slot in which you pray for all the other prayer keepers and so what that means is in that period if you're participating you're held continuously in this prayer field which is a really incredible experience raises and sustains your vibration for that whole time. Uh, and the prayer field builds and builds. And then we come back together for another Zoom call to send our prayers out into the world and to celebrate and dance. Um, our vision is to have a prayer keeper in every country on earth. And so with this technology, you don't, we don't need a massive number of people. We just need sincere souls in every country on earth to weave together this very intimate field and to create this kind of seed consciousness of, of global harmony. And that's our, that's our vision. Um, do you want to add? Yeah, Th thank you so much. I feel like I've landed in this amazing soul family group. Everything that everybody has said has just resonated. <laughs> and I'm so honoured to be here. Um, I would say that this particular, you know, there's different types of prayer and there's different types of prayer ceremony, but this particular prayer ceremony, why it is so special to me is that it really is an act of bringing your heart into oneness with the hearts of the other prayer keepers and that firstly teaches us oneness which is something we're all trying to learn how to do <laughs> and so and and it, but it also how I always describe it is it's a bit like a murmuration if you think of starlings and then they come into a murmuration because they're holding a oneness field, uh, bringing themselves together into a oneness field. That activates the miracle body. So the starling by itself is tiny. When the starling is in that, that murmuration of many starlings, it's enormous and it's beyond its own limitations. And when you are in the miracle body because of bringing yourself into oneness and therefore going beyond your own limitations every healing every bit of um manifestation everything is happening in the miracle body and so i've used this technology with different land work and collective shadow healing projects and seen miracles literally happen <laughs> because you are literally creating the miracle body um and oneness and i think you know what's amazing about it is is you feel the energy of the prayer is is something very tangible you can feel 
that you are in the energy of the medicine of the human heart. And what I've been exploring this summer is that actually this technology, it, ha it helps the unheld parts of us to learn how to be held. Because, you know, nearly all of our trauma, our shadow, uh, the, the, the problems going on in the world are, are problems caused by unheld humans <laughs> with a lot of power, <laughs> but they don't know how to hold that power. And I think one of the things that our nervous system and our emotional bodies and our, our trauma bodies and our shadows really need is this medicine of what it is like to be held and not just held for an hour. One of the things that's really important about this ceremony is you are held as you are asleep. You are held while you are eating. You are held when you're not engaging in a practice of being held. And that kind of teaches your system what it is to be held. And, and you start to operate in a very different way in the held in prayer field because, because you're held. And because you're in oneness and because you're in the miracle body. Um, it also feels so good to give on that level yeah. in my experience. Like there's receiving the prayer, but my experience doing it, when you have this opportunity to, to give on the deepest level, to let your heart, um, you know, hold everyone else in the highest possible um, prayer for them your heart feels so good there's so few opportunities we have to give on that level and i think that there's the the other aspect of it is because the only thing you have to do is focus the energy on the other prayer keepers and holding the oneness field otherwise you can pray in any way and there's this beautiful prayer weaving that happens where we have prayers with like Hindu prayers are being mixed in with pagan prayers, are being mixed in with Christian prayers, are being mixed in with people just speaking from their heart, with people holding the silence. And so you're getting this weaving of ancient magic and ancient knowledge also happening, which I feel like does something very important for our DNA. And I just want to speak slightly on the you know, this is happening in conjunction with some very important land work that is part of a project that I'm doing called From the Mountains with Love. And Uluru is really the keeper of the DNA. And so this is a profound opportunity for some really big shift to happen in the DNA, especially because of this miracle body. And one of the things my guide said is like, they were like, this is a prayer for fairness. And we had a thing for a moment where we were like, well, what does fairness actually mean when spirit's talking about fairness? And, you know, there's a lot of prayers for peace going on, but prayers for fairness are, are slightly less common. And I just love the description that spirit gave. Spirit said that fairness is the circulating of energy. It's the ability for energy to be be circulated through the giving and the receiving and the opening of our hearts. And when I think of everything that has been touched on about what's going on in the world, the equal circulating of energy feels like a really good antidote maybe, or a way to move forward or a medicine. And and this is partly why we're holding this intention for a prayer keeper in every country in the world, because we're like, if this prayer and this DNA work and this heart medicine could actually circulate to every country in the world, what would that do for the global heart and the lands and the healing that that and the purging that is happening at this time? And in order to do that. <laughs> We need people we know and people that we're meeting to reach out to people that are in other countries mm. in the world. And we can have more than one prayer keeper. So, you know, it doesn't matter if there's lots of prayer keepers in America. Um, the prayer keepers will be where they are meant to be. But just this, this idea of trying to circulate the prayer to every country in the world feels important for its its theme of fairness. Yeah. And also, I, I think, too, the thing I'm excited about is um, 
and we've talked about this as a, a new yoga of global intimacy to activate the consciousness of a new earth um and this this notion that really at the very core of the crisis that we're going through is this global intimacy disorder uh this lack of feeling between us on the global level so this is a praxis of yoga to um have a profound feeling of intimacy with with people in different countries all over the earth um and as to create that seed that seed consciousness um so um yeah we'd love you to anyone here to join us um it's very simple you know you can choose your own time uh to do your prayer you can do it in your own way um and um um it's yeah so this is our joy beautiful um, well, here's where you can learn more everybody the website is earth rising dot one earth rising dot one and um join them uh now what's going to be actually happening on august 8th of course that's the lion's gate portal um and uh, uh a lot of the people who are part of this uh, show are involved with the twin ray community that always does a lot uh, for lion's gate um so what have you got planned on 8 8 what's what's going to be happening and how can people participate well, this is like the will be at the heart of this prayer wave. So we've designed the prayer wave so that there's full coverage, the prayer field all over the world, wherever anyone is, will have um, prayers going on over that time. So that, so our prayer event, it actually starts on August 7 in Australia time uh, and goes to August 9 and has this, so it's this 48 hour prayer window so on on the lion's gate window that's going to be at the the center of that global prayer field basically and i i would say that you know when you are held in i often say that this is the best investment because you do one prayer and you get 47 prayers back <laughs> and so the investment is really amazing and it means that you're held in whatever else you're doing on the lion's gate you're, it's going to be happening in the miracle body because you're held in prayer. So all of the other things that people are doing, and I know how many light workers, shadow workers, earth workers, land workers are being called to this lion's gate because it's it's a pivotal moment that was touched on astrologically as well. Um, and it means that whatever you're doing is happening in the miracle body. And there is stuff that, like, included within the prayer there's this very important um journey that is about rebalancing the dna so that the imbalances caused from past collective traumas get sorted out that, that that's how i'm going to be using the miracle body at some point on the lion's gate as well as the land work that we're doing in, in illawoo and the mountain coding but i think that anybody that anybody doing anything within that prayer field especially in service to the collective is just gonna feel this incredible magnification of what they're doing like the healing yeah. goes deeper the manifestation gets stronger everything is happening in the miracle body when you're held in prayer we're also emphasizing the love that every person has the natural love that everyone has for their homeland i'm going to be in my homeland and part of the field that we're going to create <clears throat> will invite everyone to feel that natural love they have for their homeland and to weave that together into um you know a shared river of love um and there's something about doing it that way it accesses this kind of um you know global field at the heart level um it's a it's a very completely different angle in than going in through culture and politics and all this sort of thing it's like accessing it through our natural love for the homeland um and um you know I, it's just going to be this very beautiful global field that will come from that that way in i think no i also think that 
the prayer field and what we co-create and co-weave will be offered to Uluru and will be seeded into that great power, you know, solar plexus of the world. We're seeding, we're coding that prayer is power, that hearts in oneness is power, that our togetherness and our fairness and, and our co-weaving is power. And, and and so there's also this seeding that is happening through the, the land of uh, yeah. Beautiful. It's so good to meet meet you and introduce you to um, to your new community. Um, and uh, thank you. We are the Global Peace Tribe, and it's uh, beautiful how you are really helping to create a global movement. And it's actually a perfect segue because um, the big announcement that I wanted to make is that we are going to have a special event on Monday night with Marianne Williamson. And you're talking about prayer. Well, Marianne, one of the major, you know, she's been running for president um, on the Democratic ticket. She's won over 500,000 votes. Um, and one of her stances was, we need somebody in office who's not afraid to pray. And not just hold a Bible and sell Bibles, as one particular political candidate does, but to really, truly pray. And we all have known Marianne for decades, and she's very source-connected. That's her whole thing, is tuning into source. She has a great line, meditate in the morning, kick ass in the afternoon, and be grateful in the evening. Mm -hmm. um, and so Marianne is going to be coming back. She actually called me when Biden dropped out of the race. Um, and an opening kind of came up. She said, Scott, we are mobilizing all of our closest friends uh, to make a run for the presidency. Um, she has since you know, really come to understand that Kamala Harris and all the Democrats are lining up behind her. But she still has an important voice, and we want Marianne's voice to be heard. We want Marianne to be able to speak at the Democratic Convention. And so we want to support her. And so Marianne has agreed to come on to a special edition of The Awakening World that's going to be taking place this Monday night. So everybody notice, Monday night, regular time that we always start, 6 o'clock Pacific time. Um, and once again, I'm invited uh, Tangila and Deborah Giusti to co-host with me. So we'll all be asking questions of Marianne. And of course, Omashar will be with us. Now, mind you, it is... Uh, an important, it, you have to register for this. So um, I'm going to put the registration link into the chat box. Please register for it. Um, it's free for everybody. So all of you watching on Facebook and YouTube, obviously you can't come into our Zoom room. So I'm going to post it. It's already posted on my um, Facebook page. Um, if you take a look there, you can easily find it and register. It's free for all of the people in our Zoom room. I will send the link out to you on Monday, uh, but it's also helpful if you register that we will automatically get it in an email. Um, and please do join us Monday night at 6 p.m. Pacific time uh, for Marianne Williamson joining us. It's going to be a very special night, and we'll try and take some of your questions for her. Uh, I want to bring up, uh, I want to thank Magic and Maggie and uh, Linda Starwolf and Danalia for being with us. Thank you, David and Carilla, Andrew. Uh, it's been a really fun show. Um, it's, uh, it's been powerful. And thank you, Global Peace Tribe, for all that you do to show up. Oh, there's Maggie and Magic. Well, I'll bring our friends back up so we can see everybody one last time, our presenters. I know that Linda Starwolf went to uh, bed as she's on the East Coast in North Carolina. But thank you to all of you for being with us. And, um, you know, we call him the Alpha and Omega Man because our shows begin and end with Omashar. And so here he is to close us out for the evening. Wow, what a powerful night. And um, Karila, um, it always touches my heart when I hear a an accent like yours. And um, I'm not too sure what neck of the woods you came from, <clears throat> but it's a very juicy one. And uh, you and David, I just feel you all the way through. And, and there's 
There's the, also um, <clears throat> something I, I join in with the Hollow Movement Prayer Group and um, Global Coherence Pulse and One Field Lab and uh, Purpose Earth. They're all doing something similar, but from different angles. So there's a lot of this group worldwide wave prayer happening. And uh, anyway, I was just, um, I, I just, I love your accent, sweetheart. So <clears throat> I like yours too, David, but hey. And, uh, <laughs> so um, I have a song and it's called One Breath. And, um, <clears throat> but I've uh, Euro raved it. And so <clears throat> get ready to, to uh, shake your booty, um, who want, whoever wants to. And um, I'm going to put this on first. This is going to give you a clue of where it's going. Look at that. Uh -huh. And you see in the background? Yep, there's the Glastonbury tour. Okay. Here we go. <clears throat> All right. Me, 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 me.
that is as peppy an Obusher song as ever. Wow. And you yeah. got everybody up and moving and groovy. I've never seen Ayata move like that before. So, <laughs> fantastic. Yeah, man, you just got to do it sometimes. <laughs> everybody, I love you all so much. Thank you for being here. I look forward to seeing you all on Monday night. And please share uh, Monday night with everybody. Let's get a really nice um, audience for Marianne. Uh, she is really so precious to us. And it means a lot for uh, her to come we are her tribe, as she says, we are her tribe. So let's all show up on Monday night. And um, uh, yes, it will be recorded. But come on into the Zoom room. That's always best. Much love to all of you. I will see you on Monday night. Take care. And remember, tomorrow is Sunday. And we can make any Sunday, any moment sacred by choosing to see the divinity in all. So let's all practice seeing the divine, including when you look in the mirror. Take care, everybody. God's blessings and good night.